Washington State, at the foot of majestic Mount Rainier, rests the small town of Elby. It's the home base for the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, and its 14 miles excursion into the surrounding wilderness aboard one of a dying breed, an actual steam locomotive. around with them ever since. My favorite uncle was a steam locomotive engineer on the Northern Pacific out of Centralia, Washington. And uh, naturally, I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So during World War II, when there was a great shortage of men, uh, he got me a job at the Centralia Roundhouse. He helped me learn all about locomotives by letting me ride with him and showing me how to run them. and. Uh, educating me. Uh, also, when you work in a roundhouse, you get pretty well oriented with every kind of a locomotive that ever come into the place. Also, during this very same time, I was working for a, another railroad in Chehalis two hours a day. Well, the, the man that was master mechanic there was like a second father to me, and he took me under his wing, and he tried to show me and teach me everything about steam locomotives. And, of course, I was eager to learn about them because they were my favorite mechanical thing. So that's kind of where I got started. And from there, it just grew. Um, I've worked on Mallys, I've worked on Climax locomotives, Heisler locomotives, Shea locomotives. Um, it's about anything you, you, that's in existence. In fact, right here on this, own, this very own railroad here, we've uh, run Shays and, uh, excuse me, we've run uh, Climaxes and Heislers, rod engines. So uh, we have quite a variety here that over the years, we don't run them all at once, but uh, they're available to us. The fireman, he handles the oil controls that control the heat and temperature of the boiler. He also controls the water. So what he does is maintain steam pressure so that I have power to run the train. Um, he makes the steam and I take it away. Now, of course, you notice the fireman, he does all the greasing and gets it ready to go, prepares it for, for the trip. Uh, we have to make sure we've got fuel, water, uh, grease, supplies like that, uh, so that we have an adequate supply for the day. Uh, as far as water is concerned, it, a whole lot depends on the size of the tender um, and, and the train you're pulling. Now, uh, on the main lines, uh, they probably had water tanks every 30, 40 miles, but uh, they didn't always use them. I mean, you could skip them, yeah. depending on uh, tonnage. Now, passenger trains, they would go uh, long distances between water, maybe uh, 100 miles. Well, if we'd start from a cold start, uh, like after it's been shopped or boiler washed or something, it takes about four hours. But overnight, where it, when we come to work in the morning, it still has uh, a certain amount of steam pressure left on it, like 50 pounds, and we, we're ready to go in an hour, an hour and a half. 
The only time we uh, uh, kill it is when we take it in for a boiler wash, which is about every 30 days. Well, we are ordinarily operate it at, at, say, 170 pounds, but uh, uh, it'll move at 125. It takes about 125 pounds to operate the air compressor, so we have brakes. It was designed to burn Bunker C, which is like tar, road tar. Um, but, uh, and it was built that way when it was originally constructed. However, uh, Bunker C is hard to obtain. It's hard to handle because it, it's necessary to heat it to, so it's fluid and mobile. Otherwise, it sets up like tar. And so uh, it's uh, incomprehensible that we, we could handle it at this stage of the game. So we have found that by burning waste oil, uh, drainings from crank crankcases of big trucks uh, or automobiles either, uh, works fine. It's, it's a, in a fluid state. It burns very similar to Bunker C. Uh, of course, wood, they found out right off that wood was unsatisfactory because it took tremendous amounts. Uh, it was hard to obtain. Uh, they had to bring it and stack it by the tracks and uh, it took a long time to transfer it to the locomotive and uh, it didn't last long enough it, and it threw a tremendous amount of sparks and uh, it just wasn't satisfactory. Well, of course, coal uh, had been around a long time and so it was real easy to transfer to coal. Coal was a lot easier to handle. Uh, you can handle it with conveyor systems and uh, by dumping it in different ways. And uh, it had a lot more heat content. Uh, it lasted longer, a tender full of coal. You could go a lot further, not have to have coaling stations every uh, so many miles. They were further apart. And so it made it a lot more convenient. Now here on the west, western Washington, uh, when I went to work there in Centralia in 1943, we didn't have an oil burner on the place as far as the Northern Pacific was concerned. Um, the Union Pacific stabled locomotives there, and they were all oil. However, they ran through the state of Oregon, which had a, a law that you couldn't burn coal west of the uh, Cascade Mountains because of fire hazard. So, uh, uh, and then gradually the Northern Pacific felt that way about Western Washington as well. And during, or right after World War II, they started converting everything west of of the mountains to oil and uh, I don't think it was any cheaper for them it might have been a little but it mainly was fire hazard and also the engines they ran into Portland had to be oil burners so it just made it a lot more convenient it, it's a lot easier to handle and oil is a lot safer fire wise I mean it doesn't throw a lot of sparks uh, coal is uh, can be a very hazardous thing with with sparks and uh, ashes flying into the air, dropping on the ground and starting fires. Uh, so oil is much safer that way. And it's a lot easier for tourist railroads to handle. Uh, yeah. coal. Now, you go back east, and, and there isn't an oil burner in it, in hardly any of the tourist railroads. Uh, for one thing, they I don't think they realize or understand how to handle them. Uh, there's been one or two back there, and most of them, they converted them to oil, uh, back to coal because they, they said they didn't function properly. Well. It's just because they don't understand them, I think. It's kind of, you know, you have to be familiar with a product and a, and a machine in order to make it uh, work. But, uh, we wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Out here, we're relatively clean, and once in a while... Now, in order to, to clean our flues, coal is self-cleaning because you've got cinders running through the flues, scouring them out. We don't have that, so we have to run sand through the flues periodically. Well, when you do that, you get a, you get a cloud of black smoke and uh, sand in the air. And we try to do that when there's no passengers aboard uh, in, a, in a more or less uh, uh, discreet area so it uh, doesn't bother anybody. There's a, no, there's a tremendous draft through the firebox, and there's a little small hole about so big around in the fire door. And you just pour it through that hole, and the suction just pulls it right through the flues, and it scours them out. How often do you do that? Well, uh, we try to do it a couple of times a week. Huh. So, 
Now, on, the, on the main line, they did it several times per trip. Yeah. But see, Bunker C had a lot more uh, sooty aspect to it, and it sooted up the flues more often. So whenever they get on a tough pull going up a hill, that's when the firemen would, they had a, like a sugar scoop, and they'd just scoop it out of a box and put it over this, by this hole, and it'd suck it right out of that scoop, right into the firebox. We have to artificially do it by setting the brakes on the train and working the engine real hard to get this tremendous draft that we find necessary to do it. Otherwise, the sand will just go in and drop in the firebox, and that'll be the end of it. If it has a little steam on it, it's very simple. Uh, you have to have steam or air to atomize the oil. That means to spray it, to, to make it kind of into a fog. And so uh, as long as it has, uh, oh, 20 pounds of steam pressure, uh, you can fire it off. So mainly the, the first thing you do is, is uh, open up all your, your steam lines to, because at night you shut everything off. And so you open them up and you run steam through them to warm up the pipes so that the steam that comes out doesn't condense, turn to water. So you've got to have steam in order to uh, atomize the oil. It won't work with water or hot water. <laughs> so you get, you get all the atomizer line nice and warm by just running steam through it. It'll first come out as water because the, the pipe is cold and the steam will condense. So once you get it, you, you watch it, you can see it as soon as it's a nice spray. And it's just a simple matter of taking an old greasy rag and put a little kerosene or diesel oil on it, light a match to it, throw it in the firebox, turn on the oil valve, and when you see a little oil come in, atomize it. When it hits that fire, it blossoms into flame and you're in business. And it's just, then as you increase the steam pressure, as the steam pressure builds up, you have to keep cutting back on your atomizer because the steam pressure is greater and it automatically gives you more atomizer than what you had 10 minutes ago. So uh, your oil valve is set and it remains static, same, same amount of oil coming in. So as the steam pressure comes up, you either have to increase the oil or cut down on the atomizer. So somebody has to be around the engine. You can't just walk away from it. So what if the engine was dead cold, it didn't have any pressure, what's the okay. procedure then? We'd use the same procedure except we use, a, we use compressed air instead of steam. And this is the beauty of burning waste oil. With Bunker C you couldn't do that. You had to have a source of steam in order to heat the oil so it would actually flow through the pipes to get to the burner. Huh. But with this oil, it'll flow right to the burner at any, 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 almost any temperature. So compressed air will atomize it. It doesn't do as good a job as steam will but it does a uh, real, it does a fine job as far as firing up. So, uh, and one thing about using an air compressor, once you set the fire, nothing changes. The air compressor continues to put out the same amount of air. The oil is, a sta uh, is the same. So you can actually go away from that a little further and be gone a little longer than you can when you're using steam. Okay, the largest gauge is the steam gauge, which registers the steam pressure in the boiler. Uh, I'm, I'm only concerned with that to the extent that there's enough steam there that I can run the locomotive. Uh, the fireman watches that same gauge and tries to keep the pressure up uh, at, at our working pressure. Uh, there are two gauges for the air brakes. Uh, one indicates the main reservoir pressure, which is the big tank you see there. Uh, that's the amount of air available to, for braking. Uh, it's reduced down to a lower pressure for the train line that goes through all the cars and uh, the brakes will automatically apply if anything reduces that pressure. In other words, if an air hose would break or somebody sticks a knife in, a, in an air hose or ice pick or something, it'll stop the train automatically. So it's a fail-safe type of situation. Uh, there's also a gauge for the independent brake, the engine brake, that tells me how much cylinder pressure is on the, on the engine brake. Uh, there's also another gauge up in the front that when you open the throttle, it tells you how much steam pressure you have in the cylinders. So you know what's available, and that, that can conceivably go up as high as the boiler pressure if you're really working the engine hard. Or in a stall situation, if the, 
if the train is locked up, the brakes are set and you open the throttle wide open, that gauge will go all the way to whatever steam pressure is in the boiler. It's a very handy device so you know exactly where your throttle setting is. Uh, it's a double, double check. You can tell by, by feel where it is. You can also look at it and tell you where it is. Uh, the fireman has another, another gauge similar to that, so he kind of knows what I'm doing with the throttle, because each time you move the throttle, the steam pressure in the, in the steam chest will vary, and he has to adjust his fire accordingly. So if I go down with my throttle, he goes down with his oil. If I go up with the throttle, he increases the oil. If he increases the oil too fast, you get black smoke. So he, he is really, he has a more critical job in a sense, than what the engineer does, because he's following the engineer's every move and trying to anticipate. And, uh, and then he also has to feed water to the boiler. And of course, he, when he does that, that knocks his steam pressure down. So he has to adjust all the time. He's always adjusting. You do have a, a little adjustment on your valve setting so that steam works by expansion. So if you shorten up the stroke of the valve, it only uh, one way of saying it is that when you have the thing in full stroke, it's taking big gulps of steam into the cylinders. When you hook it up, shorten the stroke, it takes little gulps. But those gulps expand and they work, and, and, and that's where you get your economy of your operation. If you left it down taking big gulps all the time, the fireman wouldn't be able to keep up with you. You'd, you'd use more steam than what he could make. It's not a matter of rust. Well, and there's a certain amount of rust takes place, but uh, it's more of a matter of boiler scale. When you evaporate water, the impurities in the water stay in the boiler. You use the steam off of it, and these impurities collect in the bottom of it. So as we leave here or fire up each morning, we, we open a blow-off cock, and it blows all that, a lot of that stuff out. But every 30 days, you have to take it to the shop and wash it out. Now. To cut down on the amount of impurities, we add boiler treatment to the water. Uh, we have a couple of different chemicals we put in there. One that reduces the amount of oxygen in the water, and the other one that uh, keeps the solids in a suspended state. Instead of collecting on the sides of the boiler and all the stay bolts and flues and so on, uh, it keeps them mobile. And then when you blow it out, they they go off into the air, <laughs> into the woods. Uh, <clears throat> mechanically, the locomotive is practically flawless. Of course, each each year or annually, you uh, subject it to a uh, hydro test to, to make sure that it's still uh, got its original strength or close to it by using water and you. Uh, pressurize it to one and a quarter times of what the uh, working pressure is. So if it's gonna, if it's gonna blow, we hope it blows in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just like to hear the locomotive run, for one thing. It's always nice to blow the whistle, of course. <laughs> but uh, one of the nicest things is just meeting the people that come to ride the train and seeing how happy they are to uh, see a steam locomotive once again. A lot of people, uh, elderly people, will tell you that they never in their fondest dreams thought they would ever be on one. And we allow them up in the cab to look around. Some of them even get a ride, and, and they're just ecstatic. They go home uh, with a real blessing. And uh, I think that's well worth it.
When the porter is in for servicing, the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad employs a 1930 Heisler West Coast Special. It was built to haul logs around the Pacific Northwest, weighs 90 tons, and operates at 185 pounds pressure per square inch. It offers a rough ride, but climb aboard and enjoy the trip. <laughs>